Hi everybody, this is Animation and Film Studies and I am your host McGann. Today I am going to start our first episode by talking about one of the biggest, best, brightest names in animation. A lot of people don't really know who he is anymore, but back in the day, and especially at the turn of the last century in the 1900s, his work was more recognizable than what Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny would be today. Like, everybody knew about this guy. And that guy is Winsor McKay. Now, Winsor McKay started out in the industry working as someone who did comic strips for newspapers. Now, McKay was born as Zenas Winsor McKay. And the reason for this name choice was because Robert McKay McKay, Windsor McKay's father, loved his boss dearly, who was Zenas G. McKay. Now the actual date of birth for Windsor McKay is really kind of an oddball thing that's up in the air. I guess way back then they didn't keep track as well as they did, and you know, immigration was kind of a different thing. There are sources that claim that he was born September 26, 1969. That's what the most common date that comes up if you try to find his birth date. However, McKay himself has stated that he was born in Spring Lake, Michigan in 1871. But there are censor records that indicate that he was actually born in Canada in 1867 and his family just crossed over to Michigan before there was any kind of serious border security there. Nothing like you would see today. Windsor McKay's family sent him to Clearly's Business College in, I'm sure I'm going to say this wrong, but I, I think it's Ypsilanti, Michigan? Sorry if I'm screwing that up. I'm a Buckeye. I am not a Michigan fan. <laughs> uh, I can say Bucyrus though. Anyways, in 1889, Windsor left Michigan to move to Chicago with the hopes of attending the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm not really sure if that's connected to the art institutes that we see all over the country and online today, but it's pretty safe to say that it was a big hullabaloo art school for where he was at that time. Sadly though, Winsor McKay would never get to attend that university because he just didn't have the money to pay for college. It's not like the glorious times that we have now where you can get yourself indebted for life to go to college and then not be able to pay back your student loans. Back then you actually had to have the money or the school said, no, 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 we won't take you no more. So with that not panning out, in 1891, McKay ends up going down to Cincinnati to work at the Cole and Middleton's Vine Street Dime Museum. I don't really know all the details of what happened while he was in Cincinnati, but he seemed to have really loved it there because he stayed there for a long time and he ended up getting on with the Cincinnati Inquirer in 1903 and started doing his first comic strip that was called A Tale of Jungle Imps by Felix Fiddle. That was McKay's first time selling and publicizing a comic strip and he did it as a serial that ran for 43 issues, episodes, strips, whatever you want to call it, from January to November 1903. All of them were published in the Cincinnati Inquirer and he became very popular. McKay created two other comic strips that were very hugely popular, more so than even this first one, which is Little Nemo and Slumberland. and Dreams of a Rare Bit Friend. Both of those had this sort of surreal quality to them. They had to do with dreaming and just this whole fantasy land that was very amazing, beautifully drawn and crafted. And he would design these really interesting kind of characters. And it's a style that I see as being sort of simplistic in some ways, but very, very detailed in others, especially if you compare his comic drawings to something like Fairly Odd Parents. And I do use his comics to reference, you know, a cartoon show in the now times, more modern times, because way back in the day, he is one of the first pioneers of animation. And when he brought some of his comics to life, he did every cell by hand. It took him months, years, lots of money and time. And they were phenomenally well done pieces of work that led the way for so many other animators to come through. However, even though most people knew Windsor McKay by his work, he actually wrote under the pen name of Silas. And in 1911, Windsor McKay released a phenomenally well done animated short of Little Nemo in Slumberland, where he did all sorts of things with perspective and, and you know, basically brought these comic strip characters to life. And that was the first time anyone had ever done that. I, people just ate it up. They loved it. They were excited. And I, I can't even give you a good example to compare that to for this day and age. I guess the best thing I could relate with would be maybe if The Little Mermaid had been a comic strip and then all of a sudden they released it as an animated film and people were just so excited. Maybe if you look at uh, The Walking Dead going from comic to uh, TV, 
something similar like that, where just people were excited, they ate it up, they thought it was amazing. And uh, Munster McKay toured with vaudeville for a long time. In 1914, he made his most famous film uh, called Gertie the Dinosaur. Gertie the Dinosaur is, is just wow. It, it was this thing where he actually built it in to interact with the animation. And again, nobody had ever done this before. So Gertie would do something right and Windsor McKay would be standing on the stage in front of where it, what was playing. And so Gertie did something good. He'd throw her a treat and simultaneously the animation would sit there and chew it and swallow it. And it was just something nobody had ever seen it before. It, it was not done. It was not thought of like that. And Windsor McKay did every single cell by hand, including the background. It wasn't like today where, you know, one person draws a background and then they just put these different cells on top of it or they'll just, you know, change the lip flaps or something like that. He did every square inch that you see was hand drawn in each thing. And that's why it shakes a lot in his work because no matter how hard you, you try or how perfect of an artist you can be you know doing a comic strip you can't replicate that in animation the same way so there are little strange little blips and movement in his animation and a lot of people think that that makes it look cheap or tacky or not well done and to the contrary that was you know pretty much the first of its time the first of its kind pegboards had not even been invented at that point in time i mean gertie the dinosaur is so important to animation the simpsons even recently put a little you know blurb in there with mr burns and gertie and then in 1918, uh, his last really notable work that a lot of people were crazy about was The Sinking of the Lusitania. And that was basically war propaganda and, you know, it involved a ship getting attacked and being sunk and it was really kind of sad and tragic and over the top. And I I'd say you could probably say it's something like watching Pearl Harbor back when that was released and, you know, it got people upset. It got people, you know, wanting justice, wanting something. Uh, we really don't do a whole lot of movies uh, these days about what's going on right as it's going on. Maybe I'm just missing them all, but the closest I can maybe think of is uh, The Hurt Locker, showing us, you know, what's going on overseas with soldiers and making us upset, making us want to get up and do something. We're, we're very complacent these days, but back then you had movies like Battleship Potemkin and they got people on their feet and they got people to change the world. Now we have so much of it pouring in, we really don't pay attention. But moving right along, Windsor McKay kept working uh, mostly into his old age. I mean, he was very wealthy from his work, so he was able to pretty much retire do what he wanted. He ended up going to Brooklyn and that's where he died on July 26, 1934. The date that he died is actually solid. The date that he's born is not so much. So uh, he was somewhere close to his 70s. We don't know exactly what because again records weren't being kept very well in the 1800s. So next time you're watching a cartoon and you're just thinking oh I love this so much you should stop and say thank you Windsor McKay for all your hard work that helped make all of these animations possible today. Thanks for tuning in everyone and we'll see you in the next episode.